lessons learned from over a decade in OSINT, right? Who the heck am I? Well, she just said I'm a certified SANS instructor, the author of the SANS SEC 497 OSINT course, the new one. I was a federal agent, just retired over 21 years with federal law enforcement, founded multiple OSINT units within the government, had outside work authorized for most of my career. So I've done a lot of that, I've spoken at Blackcast, spoken at Wired. But it's kind of funny when it comes to CTI, I joke that like I, I totally cheat. My wife uh, ran CTI for a Fortune 100 company and still works there. So, you know, between like uh, working with her, working on the things that I've worked with, the one thing that it's given me is definitely kind of a, uh, a well-rounded viewpoint of a lot of what's going on from both public sector and private sector. And so there's just a few things that I thought would be kind of a uh, fun to share today. Agenda, no time for this, right? Only half an hour talk, dot, dot. So one thing that I want to talk about is just kind of OSINT roles and how they've been changing recently, right? Historically, OSINT roles have been relatively well-defined. If you talk to people, well, I do OSINT. Well, who do you work for? Law enforcement. Beautiful, right? Short-term, quick hit disrupt, disgrade, dismantle, right? Like how can I basically I'm focused on one, you know, small group of individuals and hopefully we can arrest them, take them off the streets and back on to the next one. Intelligence agencies, Department of Defense tend to be more holistic a lot of times, maybe looking at like a national level, right? Or a region or an industry, something like that. Private sector, right? Everyone here is very, very familiar with these indicators of compromise, just different, uh, Different things like that, you're right. What are the main threats in your industry, right? What are the TTPs? What do you need to look for? These are the types of things that we think historically is OSA roles. And if we think of them as like buckets of paint, people tend to think of it like a left hand side. Well, you do this, so this is what you do. Okay, you work here, so this is what you do. But in the real world, right, it, it looks a lot more like the right, right? These are all just getting kind of mixed and blended in together. And I've seen it from kind of both sides, from a law enforcement side, right? In my day job, you saw this because I've had analysts that no disrespect to them, just weren't technical, didn't have the training, it wasn't their experience. And now they're doing things like researching IP addresses, trying to figure out if it's a VPN or where it's coming from, or you know some of the different things that I've just seen. And it's people, like I said, they're trying to do the best they can. They just don't really have that knowledge, that training, that experience. On the flip side, right, I've seen private sector, right? Here's cyber threat intelligence, right? Hired to do technical work. And all of a sudden they're doing largely a lot of times like law enforcement roles. I can remember in a 2020 when there was a lot of civil unrest here in the United States, you know, my wife getting phone calls like, hey, I just got off the subway, like I'm supposed to go into work, but it doesn't look like it's safe for me to enter the building right now. Or, you know, vice versa, like, hey, I've been in this building for 16 hours. I don't think it's safe for me to leave. What do you think? Right. There's some uh, persistent monitoring Twitter code that I wrote for uh, when I worked at the government just to help me out in my day job. I actually gave a talk on it and released the code at the SANS OSIP Summit the year before last. And I come to find out, like, after 2020, there was two large companies, private sector companies, who were actually running that code trying to figure out, right, is it basically force protection mission, right, trying to keep their people safe. And so, like I said, you see this blending, right? You see, once again, private sector running down threats to executives, right? Kind of what we jokingly refer to sometimes as a big bounties, right? Anonymous email addresses saying they found vulnerabilities, but they want to get paid, right? All these types of things that are going on. Why does this matter? I think people in the space understand what I'm saying and know that it's happening because you witness it too, but why does it matter, right? Why do we care? A, a couple months ago, I got asked if I wanted to come on Quantico and give a talk to a bunch of executives, heads of security with Fortune 500 companies, so CISOs, CSOs, et cetera. And I'm like, yeah, that actually sounds like a blast. And that morning when I was driving on base, I, I drove right by here and I stopped pulled over my rental car, I got out, and I just kind of enjoyed it for a minute or two, took this picture and continued on. And what this is, is this is the, the long range rifle range there on Quantico on the Marine base. And it reminded me of a book that I read when I was a little kid. It was about a gentleman named Carlos Hathcock, who's one of the most decorated snipers in, in US military history, was in the Vietnam War. And I read this book on him when I was a little kid, and I've forgotten most of the book. 
But there's one story that has stuck with me to this day, even as an adult. And what it was, was he was on a mission and he had planned it out. He was going to go to this certain point and then take a shot. He was by himself, middle of nowhere. He was exhausted, hadn't slept in a couple of days, hungry, thirsty, right? Just absolutely on the verge of mentally breaking. And he was close to where he was needed to get to, but he wasn't quite there yet. But then he looked at his target and he thought, I can make this from here. Like I make this shot all the time in training. I know I can make this shot from here. Why don't I just take the shot from here and then I can get the heck out of here? and go be safe, right? And he talked about in the book, this mental struggle, this argument that he had inside of himself of, I want to take the shot from here. I know I can do it. Why am I going to wait and try to get to where I originally planned to versus having this conversation with himself of, listen, you are exhausted. You are hungry. You are thirsty. You're on the verge of mentally breaking. You made the original plan when you were well-rested. Right when you were fed, when you weren't thirsty, all of these things. Why are you going to abandon all the plan that you made when you were relaxed and thinking clearly versus right now when you're just broke? Right. And he actually stuck with it and followed through with the plan. Right. And it's just, I just, like I said, that story just always stuck with me. It always reminds me, right. There's something that I hate, and I've done a lot of digital forensics too. And one thing that I hate, and sometimes it's unavoidable, I hate doing something for the first time when it matters. Right? It's like, oh, okay, well, you're gonna, you know, examine this device, you know, do this type of thing. It's like, man, I really wish I'd done this before. Like, I really wish I had one to practice on. Right? And sometimes you can make that happen, and sometimes you can't. Right? But if you've done something before, when it, for lack of a better term, like doesn't matter. Right, when it's just you practicing, then when it comes time to do it, right, you're so much more confident, you're doing a better job, it always works for you. So I, I realize that sometimes it's unavoidable, right? I, I realize that sometimes you're so busy taking care of the things that you have to do on a day in, day out basis that you don't have time to prepare for the things that you're currently not having to work on. But that's one of the things that you can provide a lot of value in by coming to places like here, right? these summits and talking to other people to talk about what they're dealing with, because then it makes you think like, well, shoot, what happens if I deal with that? Am I ready? Right? Maybe if at all possible, I should kind of take the time and sort of prepare for some of these things now, or at least get a little more, more familiar with it. And so then when the time comes, I'm better equipped to deal with it. So you always kind of keep that in mind. And like I said, it's really good sometimes having some of these groups. Right, where we can kind of exchange ideas and hear what other people are struggling with to help you be better prepared because you'll probably end up facing it eventually too. All right. Best practices for starting an OSINT team. I've started a few of these, right, at both the uh, tactical level and at the headquarters level. And both times, some of my very first meetings were with legal, right? They really were. And so when I say work with legal, I don't just say that as like lip service, right? It's not just like, oh yeah, you should probably work in legal. Like, no, I, I really meant it. And I never warranted, like what I did, never warranted a full-time attorney, right? Thankfully, I wouldn't have wanted to do it, frankly. But I would need to get legal advice on a somewhat regular basis and just run things by people. And so what I did is I was thankful. I had two U.S. attorneys who I was not their full-time job. I never wanted to be their full-time job. But when we were first forming that relationship, we spent a little bit of extra time together and they got to understand what my unit was doing, right? And what our more we could ask those questions and then they were comfortable, right? And that's what I could reach out to one of those two, right? It has to be two because if you have one, you have none, right, between leave and everything else. So I had these two people that I could reach out to and ask them a question without having to set up the background of who we were and what we did, right? And that's huge. And I think a great example of how they can be huge is right here. This is a photo I took in a back room that was under construction at an international airport. And I was sitting around one day minding my business, and I got a phone call from another agency. And they said, hey, we would love for you to get to this international airport and post up in this, you know, basically get set up in a room there 
and we have a high value target that's going to be getting off a plane and we think we can get you about five minutes alone with our devices what kind of devices are they don't know all right roger that and it was basically like if you're cool with this you need to basically leave now right you got about a two hour window but we need to get you there now i'm like okay give me a few minutes i called up one of the two attorneys hey this is who called this is what they want to do and i got okay we think you're fine doing this and this just don't do this or this sounds good let's go do it right and the reason why that was so important is i was able to call up and get a quick answer get a quick opinion and then go do what i was going to needed to do imagine if i had called just a generic duty pager line and got an attorney that i'd never worked with before like there would have been zero chance of this actually being able to happen and it ended up being a very successful op who is this again what do you do what's the name of your unit who's your boss Okay, one more time. What's your name? Right, all of these questions, right? And it's tough. I get that. I realize that it's tough sometimes, but that's the thing. Like I said, if at all possible, forming that relationship. And so sometimes when you can get a quick opinion, you can kind of make that happen without having to set up all the background. Work with legal, right? Like I said, I'm not just paying lip service to that, like I truly, truly mean it. But try to be very careful to not put more constraints on your team than the law does, right? And a lot of us here, this may not be our decisions, but hopefully we can at least have some input. And what am I talking about this, right? Not putting more constraints on your team than the law does. There are a lot of, and this is something that I talked about with the uh, the executives over security when I was kind of talking about starting at the post unit a few months ago, there are a lot of decisions that you can make early on based on advice from legal that seem reasonable but will end up completely hamstringing your investigations down the road, right? Things like violating terms and services. How many Facebook accounts are you allowed to have? What does the name have to be? Your real name, right? One account, real name, there it is, right? Other things, you're violating the terms and services. And so it's very easy for someone to come up with an opinion of like, well, we're not going to violate the terms and services. Okay, great. But then you can hamstring your future investigations, right? What happens when some information is posted on a site somewhere you want to go see that information but you don't want to use your real account to go see it right your real name you don't want that to be tied to you well now what do you do you either don't see that information right you ask someone else you try to circumvent it unfortunately what you see a lot of times is people are asked to do something they're just trying to get the job done and so they go use their personal information to do it Right? And that's unfortunate. So try to uh, kind of have that conversation and point out like, hey, there are times when we may want to make accounts under names that are not ours to go view this data. Right? And just kind of know what you're hamstringing yourself if you don't do that. Big one, utilizing breach data, right? I was um, a couple months ago, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking to an OSINT expert. And at the very end of the podcast, the host asked this guest, what do you think about breach data? And the guest said, I, I would never use breach data, never. I don't see any difference between using breach data and buying stolen property. And the podcast host is like, yeah, I agree, I feel the same way. And I just kind of shook my head and I didn't think less of the guest, I really didn't, I, I get it. But it made me think like, okay, they probably just have a very narrow set of experiences, right? Because I start thinking of all the times that I have gone and gotten breach data for a purpose that I felt was very, very good, right? Think back to a little, little over a year ago when word got out that, hey, Wallace had been popped and there was vulnerability scans for customers sitting there on the dark web. I had public and private sector companies reaching out to me, hey, can you have this? Can you get it? Can you let us know what our information is in there? We use this. And it ended up being like, the information posted wasn't that big of a deal in, in all honesty, but I was able to grab the data, kind of look through it real quick, do some quick triaging and let them know what was out there, right? That is a very, very good, in my opinion, right, use of breach data. Numerous times breaches come out there and I have organizations call me up. I remember the MGM specifically at a Fortune 500 company reach out, hey, some of our 
executives think that they may have sensitive information in there. Can you get a copy and let us know? Yeah, absolutely, right? We can check that out. We can make that happen. And so these are the types of things, once again, if you're deciding not to do that as a policy, just know that there may be a time when you regret that. And then at that point, you're kind of fessed with, what do you do, right? You either have a blind spot or now you violate policy. And I don't like either one of those things. And that kind of goes the same thing with visiting the dark web, right? It kind of goes hand in hand with the breach data. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. But by putting more constraints on yourself than the law does, like I said, you can get yourself in a position where you're choosing between blind spot or violating your policy. Like I said, I don't like either of those two options. If, just a quick little aside there, right, if in the scope of your team's research activities is looking at employees, we make sure HR is involved. In my career, I was never uh, internal affairs, you know, inspector general, anything like that. But due to my technical skills, I would sometimes get tasked to kind of help out. And at those points, I may be the one doing the technical work, but they're the ones driving what I'm doing. Right? They're the ones telling me what I should do, what I shouldn't do, what I'm looking for, and you just try to stay in that lane. So, so you may be the one doing the technical work, but you make sure that they're the ones driving the efforts. All right. This is a fun topic to talk about, OPSEC. And it's fun and it's challenging, right? I say one of the most challenging topics to discuss in OSINT, I think it probably is the most challenging. Personally, it's fundamentally important, but the requirements can vary greatly, right? We'll talk about that. And there's a lot of definitions for what OPSEC is, but at the end of the day, it's really just kind of like a missed management framework, right? And I think a lot of us understand that you can never eliminate the risk, right? You can only reduce it. And at that point, you either accept what's left and do the work, or you don't, you don't, right? But that's what it is. A key lesson though, is you can't have good OPSEC retroactively. And this kind of goes at what we were just talking about a minute ago, is you see people sometimes of, okay, we're not, we can't go to these sites and do these things, okay. Until all of a sudden something happens. And now it's important to your boss. Now it's important to an executive or a VIP, someone. And so now just make it happen, right? The old famous, just make it happen. Well, now you have people going there and visiting an account using their personal information, right? Or, okay, fine, I'll, I'll make a sock puppet account real quick. I'll make an account under a fake name, oh, but you need a phone number. Well, shoot, now I'll just use my personal phone number to kind of verify that. But it doesn't matter. No one will ever see this. Only this service has it, and, you know, it's, it's never going to be a big deal. All fun and games, right? Until breach data gets out there until 262 million Facebook accounts tied to phone numbers get out there and you start putting these pieces together, right? You can't have good OPSEC retroactively. And I think a very good example of that was this one right here. Uh, several years ago, right, back in 2014, there was a big, it was kind of the first big uh, leak of nude photos of certain uh, celebrities. And before this hit, right, before it was news, the night before, an anonymous person with the username of Blunt Mastermind on Reddit posted one of these pictures, right? Kind of posted that they had it one more before I go to bed because I'm kind and posted the picture there. The next day, this kind of hit big, right? The news that there was a leak was out there. This was all over everywhere on the internet, on the news. And presumably what happened is Brian Hamad, right, this individual, who we'll talk to how we got to him in a minute, woke up that morning, saw that, ooh, this is big news, and they didn't just go back and delete that post. Blunt Mastermind didn't go back and delete that post. They blew away their entire account, obliterated their Reddit account. It was gone. Someone that morning woke up, saw that that was news, thought, eh, I remember a user Blunt Mastermind last night on Reddit posting a, some of these photos and went to find that thread and it was gone. And the Blunt Mastermind user account was gone. But whoever this person is, they're like, it's the internet and I know how it works. And they started putting it together using resources like archive.org, right? And other techniques we kind of talk about in the OSINT class to basically step by methodical step, put together who this was. And going and finding old posts of Blunt Mastermind that have been archived on other places and just step by step, like one time Blunt Mastermind made a comment on someone posted about uh, laws in Texas regarding Teslas and electric vehicles. And Blunt Mastermind posted, yeah, it's the same here in Georgia. Yeah. 
cool, you live in Georgia, where I step by methodical step, figured out that whoever this person was, they worked at the Southern Digital Media team. And at first glance, you kind of look at these and you're like, all right, if anyone's hanging out on the internet looking for nude photos, it's this kid right here. And it's a little skippy the intern down in the right hand side. But in another Blunt Mastermind's reply, someone had been talking about their um, like a stalking issue that a friend of theirs is dealing with. And Blunt Mastermind replied, yeah, my sister's dealt with that before. Oh, you have a sister. Well, Skippy didn't have a sister, but Brian Hamad did. Step by methodical step, identifying who Blunt Mastermind was, even though the account had been completely obliterated and destroyed. Once again, very, very difficult to have good OPSEC retroactively. When I first started in my first OSINT unit, I was told we had no budget, right? No equipment, no training, no tools, no nothing. And it sounds like a joke, but it's true. One nice thing about that is it makes your decisions very, very easy, right? You start to learn what matters, what you can accomplish for free or very, very cheap. And so we talked about this four slides ago. We kind of mentioned it as a concept, but OPSEC is a spectrum, right? On the left-hand side, we have no OPSEC. I'm using my personal computer, my personal browser, right? I've got Gmail open in one tab, and then I've got Facebook logged in with my personal account, researching a target on the next tab over, right? We don't want that. We don't want that OPSEC. On the right-hand side, the far right, we have the best OPSEC money can buy. And I've seen this, and I've been involved with these operations, right? We're just huge budgets, everything else, some amazing steps being done, going against like nation state level hackers. And those steps are good, but they're overkill for about 99% of the people out there, right? And so it's important, I think, for people to realize, listen, you're not going to get here. You're almost assuredly not going to get right here to the far right, the best ops like money can buy. If you are, and it's worth it to you, God bless you, right? But you can get here. You can get close very, very cheaply without much money, and without much effort, right? Those are the areas where I like to focus on good bang for the buck. Why it matters is you may think, ah, I'm just going to Twitter, I'm just going to Facebook, I'm giving up, say, my IP address to them. Who really cares? Well, and so you click on a link to leave that site, right? And some of these like link forwarders, link shorteners like Bitly, they will let you track the IP address and certain browser information about everyone who clicks through on that link, right? We've seen this. There was an individual a few years ago that thought that law enforcement was monitoring them potentially. And so they had some pictures and instead of posting those pictures to Facebook, they posted them somewhere else. And then on their Facebook, they posted a link to the pictures. And they were monitoring the IP address of everyone who clicked through on the link. And there was a lot of law enforcement who were clicking on the link without managing their attribution. And their IP address was coming back to the agency they worked for. And if you're wondering how we know this, like, well, did you end up arrest them later on? And they were telling you what they did. They were calling out the agencies on their Facebook page. Oh, looks like this department's looking at me. Oh, looks like this department's looking at me now too. Calling them out on the Facebook page, right? Like, thankfully I wasn't involved with this. I just kind of had a front row seat and it was just fascinating to watch. Right, just absolutely fascinating to watch. And so this one of the numerous examples I could sit here all day about why we want to manage our attribution, why it matters. Some of the best values, if you have no budget whatsoever, Tor Browser does a good job, right? Nothing is perfect, but the Tor Browser does a very, very good job. It's slow. You get a CAPTCHA every 38 seconds, right? But it's free and it does a good job of helping you manage your attribution. If you have a little bit of money, right, a VPN, very cheap, but a good job. I personally don't use a free VPN, right? Use one that you pay for. Some people use like Nord and Proton. I have zero issues with that. I personally use one called Private Internet Access. There have been other VPN providers that claim that they keep no logs, but then in order to produce logs, they have. Private Internet Access claims they keep no logs, and when order to produce, they have always failed to produce. And they haven't been jerks about it. They're just like, we keep no logs, right? And I like that. And it's not even that I'm doing, you know, I kind of joke, I try to minimize the number of felonies that I commit on any given day. I say minimize because I'm a realist. But I, I don't want logs of what I'm doing out there, right? And we have seen VPN providers get hacked and that breach data coming out here. And so then people that are trying to use VPNs to protect their privacy, all of a sudden now, all of their information is leaked out, right? And even if they were using it on a mobile device, things like the IMEI and certain selectors about the phone itself. So 
So that's why I want one that truly, I believe, keeps no logs. Virtual machines, right? VMware Player is free, right? It is. VM, Ubuntu, things like that are free. So this gives you, once again, it's not nothing is perfect, but that extra layer of like a sandbox between looking at websites, maybe, you know, viewing documents, a layer of separation between that and your actual host system with your personal information on. So these are ways for very, very free, for free or very cheaply, right, that we can really kind of make ourselves, uh, so maybe not perfect, but close to that. That's important. But we want to be careful not to let perfect be the enemy of good. You need a phone number to sign up for most sites, right? There are things out there, like this is on eBay on the left-hand side. This is TrackPhone from TrackPhone Direct. It's an Android phone with a year's worth of service for 70 bucks, right? I've done things like this numerous times. If you already have an old phone laying around, right? One of my favorite methods is Mint Mobile, the SIM card provider that's gotten a lot more popular now. You see Ryan Reynolds as their commercials. It looks like T-Mobile's trying to take them over. So we'll see what happens. It's $15 a month for a plan, which is great, but what they do is if you have a phone and you want to test, well, how's the service at my house, right? You can get a SIM card that is good for one week. Normally, the, the retail price should be $5. They are almost always 99 cents, right? Almost always 99 cents. And I've gone down and got these from like Best Buy before, just paying cash with it. On Amazon, it's a limit one purchase at a time. And so you can see when I took this uh, screenshot from my Amazon profile at eight different times, I purchased one of these one week SIM cards, right? They work. You have a phone number for a week, set up a set of accounts, you're good to go. You need to keep the accounts more long-term because then you can look at something like this, right? If you don't want the accounts to actually, if you don't want to lose them, if they ever challenge and want you to prove that you're actually who you say you are again. But these are once again, three easy ways, right? Said you think, ah, just real quick, I need an account, so I'm just going to use my personal number. It's all fun and games until the data ends up coming out as breach data. And we've seen it from so many sites, right? It just, it really seems at this point like it's a matter of when, not a matter of if. So that is uh, probably about all the time we have. We have like three minutes more persistent monitoring. Persistent monitoring is important. Right, it is worth doing, and there are places like Flashpoint that do an amazing job if you have a budget. If not, Google Alerts are free. Twitter API keys are free, right? You can do some amazing things with them. And I think one of the most underrated things for persistent monitoring right now are these Google programmable search engines. And the concept behind these are, if you come up with a very, very good Google search that say searches Docsbin and Pastebin and a few other sites, and it has some kind of modifiers on there. And so basically you've got this really great search set up and all the only thing you ever have to change is like a name that you're looking for. You can freeze that search and save that search until where now all you need to do is type in the name that you're looking for and the rest of that search is pre-filled in. And you can even share it with your friends, right? That's kind of cool, kind of cool. But why is it here, right? Why are we talking about in persistent monitoring? So you can create a limited search like that you can leave your search open for the entire web. What does this give you, right? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just use the main Google, you know, page then? Well, if you leave your search wide open, actually, if you don't, it works either way. But if you look at this, you can actually use these with an API, right? So you can write some Python code and you see there are 10,000 queries per day. So Python code to automatically search Google do your bidding with some of your searches and to fire you an alert if you want to when it finds a new result or to save them in a database or whatever it is you want to do. All right, so here's some basic Python code that kind of monitors one of these programmable search engines and just lets me know if it hits an alert. And if you're thinking, great, you know, that you, uh, but you don't really code in Python that much, it's on your to-do list, eh. Chat GPT. I didn't even write this code. Chat GPT did, right? And then modified it, did other things kind of to it. But like I said, this is a very, very good cheat for sometimes monitoring Google in a little bit more controlled way than Google Alerts. But just Google Alerts, Twitter API key, you can set up some fairly good persistent monitoring efforts with just kind of, uh, I think, frankly, some good common sense. So I'll pull open the Slack window if you have any questions or if you have any questions, I know we're at the end of my time now.